just when you thought it was safe to go onto iTunes. This is Next Level Guy. The only website that makes self-development as fun as going to the movies. It's time to take the red pill and escape the Matrix. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Next Level Guy Show podcast with your host Ian Dawson Mackay. Next Level Guy is a men's interview, interest and improvement website where I interview the greats from all industries to help others better their lives. Listen to the experts in their respective fields being quizzed and learn something new. For today's episode we're speaking to coach Tom Davey. He's a BJJ coach which stands for Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and he's also the owner of the Grappling Academy website. He's a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt an MMA and shoot fighting coach, and he's the head instructor and owner of the South Coast BJJ and MMA Centre. He received his grading from world champion and coral belt jiu-jitsu professor, Carlos Macedo. He, um, coaching philosophy is a reflection of his gym's ethos, and he believes in a detailed and enjoyable learning environment. He's someone who I've greatly admired. His videos are awesome and he's a fantastic coach. I'm delighted to have him on the show and rack his brain on how he can become the best at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu that we possibly can. And it's felt like 10 minutes and it lasted over an hour. I'm desperate to get him back on again and really get down to the nitty gritty. But today's interview, I just wanted to introduce you to Coach Tom if you're just new to Jiu-Jitsu or you're planning to try it out. His videos are amazing. He's a really detailed coach. He makes it fun and enjoyable and you learn so much at all the little um, details of the training, of the techniques. He explains really detailed concepts in such layman terms. He's a fantastic coach and somebody you have to check out and subscribe to him on YouTube. Um, Watching his teachings will change your skill level and enjoyment of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu forever. But before we get to the interview, as usual, we'll just give a quick word about our affiliates. I use the affiliates monies that I get in to help me promote and um, develop the show. Now, I've set up some amazing deals with some amazing companies. This allows me to get the usual special discount codes, special offers, listener exclusives, that sort of thing. Please go to www.nextlevelguy.com forward slash affiliates for further information. Now, I'm using my Kindle almost every day. I got it from Amazon. I read ebooks when I travel, and I love films and the TV shows that you can get through Amazon Prime. Honestly, that's one of the best things I signed up for. The Cognitive Enhancer, Alpha Brain, is something that will get your brain flowing, and you'll find it'll run smoother and faster. It's been tested, and in, I think it's double placebo tests, and it's been shown to be very effective. If you go into the onit.com, and you use the code name Next Level Guy, you'll get 10% off all your order. They have amazing deals there on things like barbells in the shape of superheroes, they have various apparel, special offers, they have supplements of all kind in nature. So, whatever you want to fix, improve, enhance, they've got a supplement for it. If you want to go and show off the gains that you've got from going to the gym and working on like your legs and your ass, you need to get a pair of barbell apparel jeans. They're super soft, super comfy and hug you in all the right places. If you use Next Level Guy, that's Next Level Guy, like onit.coms, and it's all one word, you'll get 10% off in the discount code section. For others, I'm particularly loving The Natural, which is the pickup guidance video course by RSD Max. He aims to help you become a natural woman. I also am a rereading Ross Edgley's awesome new book, The World's Fittest Book. In this book, he discusses about his concepts and philosophies on how to become super fit no matter what you want to do and achieve your goals. He's also just about to embark on a tour of the UK at the moment, which is really impressive because he's also just swam around the UK without going on dry land once. And in this tour, he's going to discuss about it. So use my Amazon link, get the book and then go buy a ticket and go and see the man in person. It really will be an amazing show and something that you really need to check out if you're at all serious about becoming the greatest version of yourself, fitness wise, possible. 
Now, there's so many other great offers there. There's things like my protein Under Armour, the protein works, Bulletproof Coffee, Meandies, Gains Box, Dollar Shave Club, and so, so many more. I in, um, increase these offers every uh, week, hopefully. I put out brand new special offers, and I also try to set up new deals whenever I can. So please keep an eye out on it. If you go to www.nextlevelguy.com forward slash affiliates, that's www.nextlevelguy.com forward slash affiliates, or you can find it in the top bar of the site. There really is something for everybody. There's a the perfect gift for your family or even for yourself. If you're getting secret Santas, if you're getting a present for a work colleague, if you're getting something small, something big, check it out. There, You'd be amazed at what you can find. Regardless of the occasion, there's something there for everybody. New deals and offers are added all the time, so please keep an eye on this page and use and share them as you want. Pass them out to friends, use them for anything and everything. Um, all commissions are spent on improving the website and making the show as best as possible for you, the listeners, who I thoroughly appreciate you coming and listening. Now, I hope you have as much fun listening to this one as I did during the interview, and I hope to have Coach Tom back on shortly. Hope you enjoy. Massive thank you for doing this, Tom. I'm a massive fan, but, you know, for those guys outside of the jiu-jitsu community who maybe don't know who you are, could you just give a quick, you know, short intro of who you are and what you think you're famous for? <laughs> I don't know about being too famous in outside of jiu-jitsu, but I'm uh, 31, uh, live in Australia for part of the year and work in uh, and travel and uh, around the world for other part. Um, so, yeah, I've been doing Brazilian jiu-jitsu uh, and other martial arts for all my life, but Brazilian jiu-jitsu sort of really stole my heart and uh, it was just something that uh, – I don't know. I just uh, I started doing five, six, seven hours a day just on that one thing a long time ago. And then you sort of wake up 10, 15 years later and you kind of realize that you've maybe learned as much as anyone else out there. I mean, obviously, there's plenty of people out there that are better grapplers or would know more than me and have much more wisdom, etc. But certainly uh, it added up quick. It added up quick. So I consider myself as a guy that's done a uh, PhD in uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, but I just enjoy training. I enjoy teaching. I love meeting people. I love hanging out. Um, I love traveling. And I'm just lucky I've found a life where I get to do all those things that I love every day. Well, it certainly comes across in your videos. You know, it's, it's you've got one of those channels that if I said, you know, oh, have you seen Coach Tom? Maybe he don't, they're not quite sure, but, you know, it's like the, the Grappling Academy, they go, yeah, oh, that guy, love that guy. <laughs> so it's you know, one of those videos um, that when I would chat in class about a certain technique, they would go, oh, have you seen, like, have you seen his video on this? Or you check out this and that. So it's yourself and um, Nick Alban Chewy, you know, and you're the, the, the go-to nice, for the class. Yeah, I've so yeah. I absolutely love your stuff. I mean, how did you get into it? Because I've, I mean, I'm a blue belt, um, no tabs at the moment, but I, I got my um, blue belt on December, just passed. But how did? Oh, congratulations! Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate. It. So, how did you get into it? Though you said you've been doing it all your life. I I only started when I was thirty five. You know, were you always wow. des- were you always destined to do this, or? I was a really small kid. I mean, I, I know now I'm sort of like two twenty six or four, but I was a real small kid, and I started school. Uh, I think about a year and a half too early. In in. in in, we're meant to sort of be about five and a half years old when we start, uh, you know, I guess, full-time school here in Australia. So I'd uh, just turned four. So um, I was just smaller. And, uh, you know, I, I like to think I, I try to be a nice guy, but sometimes that niceness can be mistaken for weakness. And certainly at one point in my life, uh, that was weakness. And uh, so like a lot of martial artists, I have a story of uh, um, like a, a father that uh, wasn't there and when he was, it was uh, not pleasant and then uh, bullying sort of at school or whatever. So it was just one of those typical situations um, that leads people to martial arts and then, you know, I trained a few other martial arts and had a few uh, uh, fights and altercations and I I love all martial arts. I I still teach, you know, a complete mixed martial arts spectrum uh, several times a week at my academy but I just felt that, when I, when I discovered jiu-jitsu, one, I really enjoyed it. 
I really enjoyed it. It felt natural to me. I didn't even know what it was. I was actually rolling for about an hour a day before I knew the concept of what rolling or BJJ was. So, I mean, there's that. But after you use jiu-jitsu in a street fight and you're like, wow, that that worked just like the movies, just like <laughs> Bruce Lee, <laughs> just like I always thought they would, I think that just really sells it to you. And then when you develop the friendships and the relationships and the fitness and everything that comes from BJJ, um, I mean, how can you go back? Uh, especially, I mean, now I, it seems crazy because now I have a, my whole life revolves around it. You know, I support my family doing this and, uh, and my kids train, my wife trains. Uh, it's like my whole life. Every time I travel, I'm teaching and, uh, and training and uh, doing seminars and stuff. And I, uh, I love it. I could not ask for a better life, but that's what drew me to jujitsu, uh, initially. Um, and just, yeah, the fact that it works. I know every martial artist says that their style is the secret style and there are incredible styles out there. You know that. But um, I tell you what, for the average man or woman, Ian, as you know, like you're a blue belt, you're a made man in the jiu-jitsu community now. <laughs> you are, you know, like the concept of street self-defense and stuff is a little bit more predictable. There's certainly not a lot of fear, not very many color belts in jiu-jitsu really fear a street confrontation because they know what happens when they roll with the beginner in class. Um, and so, yeah, that's my story, Ian. That's why I just love it so much. I don't know. It feels like it's what I was put here on earth to do. <laughs> I mean, that's fantastic. So few people have that feeling, you know, where like, they kind of feel, you know, they bump about from life and you, you never know what you're doing. And I don't know, it's when I watch your videos, it's like you were designed for it. You know, you have that infectious personality. You can't help but fall in love with jiu-jitsu. And I also like feel like I'm going down the rabbit hole with you. You know, it's like one video after another, after another. And before I know it, I'm just gone nonstop. But, you know, have, one of the things I've often wondered was, they always say a black belt is a white belt who's never given up. Mm. Is there a point that you ever considered giving it up? I mean, you said your kids are in, you're doing it, your wife's doing it. Is there any point that you just thought, you know, enough's enough? And how did you overcome that? Because one of the biggest things I've noticed with our new guys is they have that wee hurdle once they've been choked out, once they're maybe not as picking up as fast as the other guys they going to go, oh, no, I can't do this. You know, they have to earn the stripes, so to speak. Have you ever encountered that? Yeah, definitely. Well, I think we hit the nail on the head. I mean, we've all heard that comment that the black belt is the white belt that never quit. Now, having said that, I know some men that have been doing jiu-jitsu for nearly 30 years that aren't black belts, and so I don't believe everyone can get a black belt in jiu-jitsu. I, I believe everyone can. I don't believe everyone is willing to pay the price. And as you know, rocking up to training is only – like that's half of it. But then you have to, you know, focus and improve. And even in yourself, I'm sure you'll come across days as you transition to purple belt of the blue belt blues, as I like to call it. But, um, you know, I think when it comes to quitting, like for me, uh, there were times where uh, I wasn't teaching – and uh, so for a couple of years, I just trained with uh, actually my first blue belt, actually. And we'd just train and do our own thing. And I think that would be as close to, to, to quitting per se, just because I wasn't doing organized competitions. I was just training a couple of times a week with a friend, um, physical training, doing still all my study and everything like that. But I'd say that's as close as I'd come to quitting. I mean, I don't think I could never just stop. I, I, I couldn't stop. Uh, actually, my best friend did stop. And he stopped after he got his blue belt about uh, 10 years ago. And um, and he uh, he's only just come back actually two weeks ago. And so in that time, you know, I've gone obviously through the black belt and done everything else. And he, and he hasn't. And he talks about it as the biggest regret he has in his life, which is a pretty interesting statement. So I think I just know I'd regret it so much. So, hey, how can I give up? Well, how can I give up something I love? Uh, so much. And I mean, sometimes I fear my body and might do it. You know, my body might get really injured one day, but to be honest, my body feels great. I take care of it. Uh, it feels great. So I don't see me quitting anytime soon. Um, whether I'm going to be able to roll for like a couple hours every day in the future, I don't know. <laughs> that might have to, to tone down a little bit as I get into maybe my 50s, 60s, etc. But for the next 20 years, no way. I'm here to play.
Oh, that's a scary thought for anybody competing against you. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> well, I, st- I started in November um, a year ago, and it was there was a bunch of us that started, and you know, we all. St- I think there's about out of the six of us who started, four are still there, and two. Wow, that's high. You know, and it's it's quite amazing how we've kind of we've we've made some great friendships from it. And I put it off starting for ages, and I kept saying I needed to get fit. Then I was going to do it when I went to this place. Then I was going to do it after this place. But it is truly a life changing art. I mean, what's the kind of usual things you know you hear from some people who are wanting to do it but maybe not you know how do you encourage them to take part because it, it has transformed their life but it's hard to explain it to somebody who's only seen it on youtube or whatever you know the benefits are so massive but how would you how would you encourage somebody who's not sure to give it a go because once you're down that rabbit hole there's no way coming back definitely it's it's one of those things Ian. i guess i'm of two minds to it i i I, I obviously, I want everyone to have the benefits of jiu-jitsu. I mean, to the outside man or woman looking in, of course, jiu-jitsu is just this thing where we roll around in, you know, surf clothing or, or pajamas <laughs> and, and choke each other. And, you know, it's obviously, as you know, uh, it's so much more than that. I, I would say that your mat benefits in jiu-jitsu will be 5 to 10% of your total jiu-jitsu benefits at most. I mean, how many street fights are you getting in to need these combative skills? I mean, once you're a blue belt, that's your street fighting jiu-jitsu done. So, you know, like you, I, I think for me, um, I want people to to experience all the benefits, the community, the health, the happiness. You know, it's done so much for so many people, including myself. It's been the pivotal thing in my life. Um, however, having said that, yes, how many times do I hear, I mean, every month, oh, I've been wanting to join for three years, but... I wanted to get fit first and it's like, no, come and then you'll get fit. <laughs> um, fitness comes from training. You know, don't train and get fit enough to now be fit. Uh, just come to jiu-jitsu. But at the same token, I guess as an academy owner, I've never had a shortage of students per se. People have always been willing to travel down and train with me and uh, I feel very blessed and fortunate for that. So at the same token, I try not to encourage too many people to take it up because the last thing I want is encourage them to take it up. And then they weren't ready uh, because, you know, jujitsu, it gives a lot to you, but it asks of you first. Like, you know that, Um, you know, you learn how to deal with stress and how to solve problems and do these, say, a different thing. But you learn that from some, you know, 100 kilo guy uh, putting you inside control and pinning you there and you feel like throwing up and you just want to quit and you don't. So you have to pay first. And I don't think everyone is willing to to pay that price but the reward for paying that price like any hard smart work in life is just far beyond the investment and uh so i I want people to find that out but i know that the process of finding it out ian is one that is somewhat demanding physically and mentally i mean you know the struggles uh anyone who wears a blue belt has struggled a lot and they've also achieved a lot and grown a lot and uh so I want people to take that path. But, you know, the thing I hate is people that come into jiu-jitsu and then quit. Um, I'm lucky. Sounds like your academy too, but I have a very low attrition rate at my academy. But um, but still, when I – because my time is limited, my time is my most valuable resource. From my perspective, Ian, uh, I don't like to encourage too many people to give jiu-jitsu a shot because if I have to encourage them to get in the door, chances are I'm going to have to be encouraging them to stay in maybe in one, three, six, twelve 12 months. And uh, for me, that's just too temporary. I want to build people like I already have, obviously, that teach their own academies so that the jiu-jitsu knowledge and benefit can go further because I guess I've only got 24 hours in a day so I want to maximize my time and maximize the amount of reach that jiu-jitsu can give to people and that's why I started the Grappling Academy YouTube channel uh, just because I wanted to get my message out uh, to to more people. And would you say that's what you know sort of gets you out of bed because I think I read somewhere when I was doing my sort of research that your mission was to get people to to have a successful life from jiu-jitsu on and off the mats. You know, too many people think it's just training, but that what you get from it 
in so many aspects of like you know more confidence fitter you know you you don't look you, you know if you're in uh altercation you 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 know you can beat somebody up but you don't need to prove yourself you know it helps you like in so many different ways but is that is that your overall mission is that what drives you now you've got your blue your black belt to just keep going again and again yeah i mean every i i teach every day i have no days off i have no mornings off i don't take evenings off like i uh i teach a lot obviously i'm a family man too and uh but yeah just getting up every day like jujitsu makes my life better i mean i'm my first customer <laughs> i guess <laughs> um do, do you know jujitsu transformed my life uh people some people know me you know that have known me for the last 31 and a half years but others that don't don't realize that like many martial artists you know my my result is a life of transformation the man i am today is somewhat of an opposite of the the boy i was when i started so i know what it's done for me so i just keep you know paying homage to that and 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 working every day and and i love it i i love it i mean like you said, you want to be prepared for a street confrontation and, you know, I'm no some tough street fighter guy, but I've also, uh, I'm not, I'm not afraid to stand up to any man, which is not always a wise thing. I'm not recommending your listeners do this, but because of that, you know, altercations wise, yeah, sure. Jiu-Jitsu can come in handy, but I think knowing that you can handle confrontation, that's very important for both men and women in our society. Cause ultimately any sort of whether it's a lawsuit or a, a customer complaint, I don't know, whatever people deal with in their lives, ultimately the ultimate form of confrontation is still obviously violence. And when you know that you can handle that, it becomes somewhat of a uh, of uh, an easier thing. And especially like, for instance, with you in uh, the UK and us here in Australia, like we don't have the gun violence. So, you know, if you are going to get attacked, most of the time, you know, like you can defend yourself. It's not like someone pulls out a gun and shoots you. <laughs> mm. Like uh, when I'm in Dallas and Texas and stuff. So, uh, but, you know, at the same time, uh, I think jujitsu and my, my, my goal for the Grappling Academy was, yeah, just to introduce people uh, for free, obviously, to uh, jujitsu. I never planned on any income coming from that business or anything like that because the whole point was to give back. Um, that was the point. Jiu-Jitsu has given me so much. For me not to give back, I feel, would be incredibly selfish of me. And who knows, there's another Tom Davy out there or another Ian that um, just Jiu-Jitsu could do something big in their lives. And if they don't find out, that will never happen. And they might spend the whole rest of their life scared or unconfident or whatever it is. And in reality, all they had to do was rock up and put on a pair of jammers and wrestle someone. So have have you seen like a a major transformation like that? You know because I find that interesting that you look at it like oh I wouldn't have been that person without jujitsu. You know it's like what what makes you think that that you like because you all seem like you're destined to become the martial artist, the coach, the the friend that helps people transform themselves. You know what do you think you would have become? What sort of man do you think you would have been if you hadn't found jujitsu? Would you have got into trouble, do you think, or? That, that's, a, that's a great question. I mean, it's it's hard to say. You know, sometimes, like I say, without jiu-jitsu, I would have led a miserable life. I mean, we never know, and we're never going to know, are we? But at the end of the day, for me, I guess it's pretty easy to, to see that, you know, my life changed when jiu-jitsu came in. And for the, the friends and family that have known me, pre, during, and post, they will certainly say the same thing because there's been nothing else in and of itself that has created change. Um, yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. Like I, I've always tried to evolve as a person. Like every day I try to grow in like every way, you know, like that's what I try to do. I try to be a better, better husband, a better martial artist, a better coach, a better business owner, you know, a better father, a better son, whatever it is. I'm trying to be better every day. And I think jiu-jitsu is this wonderful crucible of bullshit-free self-improvement. You know, like there's so much things we can learn about and do when it comes to improving our lives, uh, whether it's books or people talk, whatever. You know, there's like so much stuff out there in today's media. But I think sometimes a little bit of nonsense gets thrown in there and people forget that most of the time, if you want to have a happy life, you know, you work hard, you surround yourself with good people and you, and you, you improve yourself every day. 
Um, and I think it's a somewhat simple recipe. And I think jujitsu is that in most academies around the world is just that. So it's like having the world's cheapest life coach just walk around with you every day because jujitsu class is just real. You know, results are real, failure is real. And I think you sort of just, you get used to that. You know, if you get armbarred, you get armbarred. I don't care if you had a bad day. That was just the result of actions and inactions. And I think once you learn that, it becomes quite good. If you want to get good at armbars, you know what you'd have to do, Ian. Like say if you only do kimuras and you want to get good armbars, well, you're going to have to basically say, I'm going to go for 100 armbars a night, which realistically means that your buddies are now going to start passing your guard and beat me up more than they should because you're trying to improve. But by taking that hard work, you know, on the chin and by doing those reps and being willing to fail, which is a massive thing in life that I think is the biggest thing that helped me, being willing to fail um, will let your armbars shine. You know, I tell all my guys, if they want to get good at arm bars, they need to fail 20 times a night at arm bars. That's their goal. I don't care how many you get, not interested, but fail 20 times until you can't fail 20 times. And uh, when you fail at failing at 20 times, that means you're getting lots of arm bars, which means that you've got great arm bars. So I try to encourage that sort of thing in my academy, Ian, um, because I think getting over the fear of failure is arguably one of the most empowering things that at least I've found for men and women, you know, in today's society. Yeah, I mean, I love that because I I went through that phase of every role I had. I was using strength when I first started. I, I you know, I was fighting for every single thing. I, I don't think I used technique for, for the first few while, you know. And you get these guys who come into the gym, you know, and they're like built like a brick shit house, shall we say? Mm. And this little this little girl is spinning around and you know she's trapping them or this smaller guy is holding them down because he knows technique and leverage points and tempo and you know all this kind of stuff so how do you train that into somebody because i struggled with that for ages how do you learn to let go of the ego and become that student who absorbs it who learns who who wants to make mistakes you know even now i find a lot of you know, like roles, we we go to win, and we don't make mistakes. So, how do you just switch that off and just you know help develop your jujitsu by learning to make mistakes? Well, I think uh, I mean it's a, it's a thing we all have to face and challenge, and uh, you, you know, grow in and of ourselves of it. I, I don't know if I have a way that works for everyone, but one thing that I do encourage sometimes, especially when it comes to separating like winning in the academy from learning. I, I mean, I try to be pretty strict with that. Like when you walk into my gym, I've got that sign. It's up in heaps of gyms. It's an old thing on a lot of the jiu-jitsu gyms that says like, you know, leave your ego at the door for this is a place of learning. And uh, and and I do mean that. That's why the sign's up. And uh, I sometimes I'll just encourage guys to maybe do a competition, you know, because – Competition's not for everybody, but I think the growth of competition is for everybody. I mean, don't compete for results. That's pretty stupid. It's a 50-50 thing at best, so don't get too excited about results. But just by competing, you've now created an arena of combat, which makes your training floor, which if you don't compete, is your arena of combat. You now focus on learning in the academy because you've got a combat arena so this is your training arena. So I find that, yeah, some of the guys in my academy that have to use their skills perhaps for their profession or that compete, they can separate it better because they've got a proving ground. They've got something that they get to test and fight. So when they come to the academy, it's about learning. But at the same time, Ian, you know, I've seen jiu-jitsu journeys damaged. No one talks about this because the fact is instructors want students that don't go hard. They're not going to injure people. They're going to rock up. They're not going to burn out, you know, that they want these nice guys training. But at the same token, you know, there is some truth to saying that if you don't have any ego on the line, then maybe you won't perform to your greatest potential. And dare I quote a quote from someone who's not well liked at the moment, and I'm not quoting this for political reasons, obviously. <laughs> I live in Australia, for God's sake. But Donald Trump had an interesting quote, and I often say this to people because it riles people up, but I actually think there's some truth to it. And he wrote in a book that if you show me someone with no ego, I'll show you a total loser. And I thought that was a really interesting comment because, unfortunately, I've found somewhat it to be true. Men that are – or women, 
controlled by ego will ruin your life. I think I've even been there in my life for sure, 110%. But then with no ego, again, you know, I've been the guy living in the retreat and doing all meditating every day and giving his stuff away. I've been that guy too. And I will say that I felt like I shortchanged myself during that era of my life in both eras, being ego maniacal and uh, ego uh, averse, aversive, I guess. Um, the the balance is in the middle. So like when I go into a jiu-jitsu academy, yeah, you should still have goals and stuff, but your goal isn't to win. Your goal is to improve or win in a certain way. Um, so I don't think it's wrong you going into the academy and saying, you know what, like, I want to get three arm bars tonight. That's really cool. Like, I, I think that's okay. You can go and use as much strength as you need to achieve that, you know, um, but only if it's pushing forward your learning. You know, you want to get good arm bars. You don't want to arm bar your three friends. You want to get good arm bars. So I think just being separate that and keeping the long-term hat on, you know, your jiu-jitsu isn't judged by your training tomorrow night, Ian. Your jiu-jitsu will be judged at the end of your life. So I think keeping that long-term focus helps tremendously. Yeah, I love that. I've, I've never really considered, you know, like I've thought about competing, but I've never really thought about how we look at, you know, the mats because we look at that as a competition over, you know, like yeah. that's that's a proving zone because we, we haven't got somewhere else to take it. And I, I found it strange when I first started, you know, that I've always been the BFG, you know, like the big friendly giant. And then suddenly <laughs> you're inside somebody's personal space. They're on top of you. They're trying to hurt you. They're trying to do, you know, then the shake comes. It, it, I always find that weird. It, it's a strange sort of dichotomy <laughs> for a lot of guys when they first start. So let's say that you have a brand new student, somebody who's wanting to do it for themselves. What what would you advise them to do? You know, what, how would you pick yeah, create the perfect student you know what do you want them to think about what would be their goals for six months what would you want to see that in them you know is it sure i mean i, I mean i actually get to do this like i have some people that will travel down to my academy and say look i'm willing to do as many private lessons or group classes you tell me what when where you know like so i actually have some experience in this like trying to create this, yeah, prototypical perfect student. Um, well, I mean, obviously, a quantity of training is always going to help. If I was to create a perfect student, I would say the, the more the better, up to the point where too much is too much. So I've seen, I won't mention his name, he's a nice guy, but actually one of my current students first came to me years ago and he was training like seven days a week and uh, – and I'm like, it's too much, man. This is too much. It's either going to be too much for your body or your relationship or your work. Like this is seems too much, you know. And, uh, of course, that's what happened, you know. And he had to actually leave jiu-jitsu. And I was just telling him, just do two times a week, you know. Just two, three times a week is fine, man. Just, just do that. But he wanted to do more. And he got great results but got burnt out. So I'm very conscious of that. The, the idea that you can, for instance, train with weights in ways that create fantastic short-term gain but create, you know, long-term pain and weakness in many ways. I believe jiu-jitsu is the same. I, I think there's a great uh, – I, I think the concept of slow starters can be fast finishers is true in jiu-jitsu. So I like to encourage people when they start – I have a syllabus, like a white to blue belt syllabus. I encourage people to focus on that because at the end of the day, I'm not building you as a grappler yet. I'm building the foundation for you as a grappler. For me, you as a grappler will only really – start to evolve like the unique parts of your jiu-jitsu um when you're a blue belt that that's personally what i believe like i believe the white to blue is a foundation phase and then blue up is now this is like you like you <laughs> right um this is now about you um so for a student you know sometimes if they can get private lessons well that's obviously going to drastically increase their uptake of information but that is expensive you know no matter where you go I try to keep my rates as cheap as I can, uh, but even still, you know, like it's still expensive. And uh, so that's not for everybody. But I would just say someone who has goals and someone who improves every session. So every time you roll, just know what you're going to do differently next time. That's every roll. Not every night of rolling, every roll. So every roll, you roll with me and you tap me out with an armbar. Well, I'm going to get a drink and I'm going to say, all right, I've got to keep my elbows in close to my sides and rotate when I see his hips move. You know, I'm not going to, I'm going to prevent that arm by next time. 
And then I roll with you, mate. And then I tap him with a cross choke, but he rolled me off at the end. So I'm like, okay, well, I, I like the cross choke, but I've got to keep my knees wider. Like every roll, I'm going to change something. And I think that is the biggest secret for constant progress is you need to constantly progress. Rocking up to training and repeating the same old thing isn't going to do it because you'll get a little bit better, but you're getting a little bit older, a little bit more injured. You know, it kind of comes out in the wash. Whereas uh, if you improve every roll, win or lose, that's how you get really good fast. And I've been lucky. I've spent time around a lot of world champions. And one of the interesting things, I remember speaking to the wife of a, uh, of a really well-known guy, and she said his secret is he never makes the same mistake twice. And uh, I've heard that several times out of the mouths of world champions, just saying, I just don't make the same mistake twice. I remember seeing a world champion get tapped on a mat and uh, I won't mention his name for obvious reasons because it was someone who he should have killed, but it was kind of a tricky submission. It's actually a favorite of mine, but he got caught out by a guy that he would have killed, like one of his training partners. And it blew me away because I'm like, this guy shouldn't be tapped by any human being. But he's like, well, yeah, that just you know, wasn't aware of that and won't be letting that happen again. And then he just destroyed a whole bunch of black belts in a tournament after that. And I love that. I love seeing his vulnerability and him just saying, you know what, I'm not going to let that happen again. And yeah, that taught me a lot. And uh, so that's what I would say to students, you know, just uh, learn something every role, every night, every day, and just try to get 1% better, 1% better. That's all. Just 1% better every day and you'll be a beast. I love that because I I just went down the the wrong way of everything was a fight. You know, it was, <laughs> it, was it was almost like a proof of your masculinity that if you won, you're better than the other guy. Whereas now I kind of, I've always been the guy that helps other people, you know, like try to explain a concept rather than a technique. You know, maybe they don't get to sh- like why shrimping or the movements, you know, like he, our coach, um, Professor Ricky Gillian is always mentioning about you can overcomplicate it. You know, if you try to teach a, a new person all these techniques and you know, hold the leg here and staple and then spin here, you know, p- people don't understand that. But if you say to them, push the leg down and step over it, they go, ah, right, okay, that makes sense. But, you know, was there was that the kind of change to your skill development that gave you the biggest boost? You know, was it a case of you looking and going, okay, I'm going to go for one percent each roll? Was that the thing that gave you the biggest return for your back, sort of thing? Yeah, I, I definitely think so. I, you know, like honing down, Ian. I mean, there's one thing I just realized. Like, I've just been fortunate that you know, due to my life circumstances and a few things like that. Um, I guess I've been able to travel and train with so many amazing men and and women around this planet. And, um, you know, I try to pick something up from everybody, just like I'm sure you probably do with your encounters with other people too. And, uh, and I think for me, just realizing that it's all about the little details. Like I know you hear this talk about, and they use this term invisible jujitsu. Well, first of all, it's not invisible. It's just hard to see. And you just need to go. I mean, I believe a world-class black belt, say let's take Hodger Gracie's cross choke. I don't believe it's 10 times better than a normal person's cross choke. In fact, I only believe it's about 5% better. But that 5% is the 5% you're fighting for. Like at a high level, that's everything. It's just in small fractions of percentages. And uh, so I think when you really start honing down on things, what I call diving deep, as opposed opposed to going broad uh, with a wide array of techniques, by going deep, I believe you can use that technique not only to make it an incredibly sharp, because you need incredibly sharp weapons at black belt competition uh, level eventually, but more so that you use a technique to learn about those principles. So, for instance, you spoke about this concept of, I mean, from what you said, like push the leg down, step over. Say you're doing a Sao Paulo pass, doesn't matter. But you can use one pass, one choke, one sweep, one armbar, it doesn't matter, one technique, and then you can learn all the principles of it. So if you take a cross choke, you can learn about levers and fulcrums. You can learn about wedges. You can learn about like anticipating problems and trapping their problems. You can look about hedging your bets for your next submission if you're rolled off. Um, you know, like you, you can learn so much. So I think once people get their basic syllabus and stuff like that down, which, you know, sometimes takes a couple of years and it's their blue belt when that's marked, 
um, then then it's time to go on to your own journey. And I really think jiu-jitsu does need to be yours, like especially post blue belt. I mean, you're not really qualified to make stuff up a white belt. But at Blue Belt, I really think, yeah, creating your own journey and, and just working out like what works for you, what makes you special and unique on the mats and work with that, um, not in terms of performance, although that is how you get really good. Um, it's more a terms of just be true to yourself as a grappler and develop yourself as a grappler because what makes you, you unique will be what makes you dangerous. And I can tell you for a fact that nearly every world champ or extremely high level grappler not of which are all world champs you know the best grapplers in the world aren't necessarily the world champions that's an unfortunately true fact that they all have something really unique you know if you take a, a world champion or someone like that and you look at them and and i try to as a coach because yeah sure i still fight and compete at worlds and do all this stuff but you know obviously i'm a coach i'm a coach that competes not a competitor that coaches it's very different so as a coach that competes, when I look at like high level champions and things like that, I'm obviously trying to look at the things they do because I know if I can get my students to think the way they think and do what they do, how they do it, that means they're going to achieve the same results. But then you sort of realize that they're all doing their unique stuff and they're all uniquely talented. You know, you take any world champion and you go, well, this guy didn't look like much. Think again, think again. You know, like I was talking to Hegan Machado about uh, – uh, BJ Penn, and he's like, that guy is freakishly flexible and freakishly strong for his size. And you think it's not that case, but it is that case. He said to me when like BJ was like a blue belt, I think, he was tapping out like the black belts at the academy in Brazil or whatever where we're at, you know. And uh, that's just crazy. You know, he looks like a guy that isn't an athlete, but people talk about his phenomenal athleticism. He's very strong, very flexible, and obviously extremely talented. And so I think finding those things, like what makes you special? Is it that you're smarter than others? Well, that means you'll be able to link combinations. Are you more flexible? Well, that means you'll be better at making certain submissions work and getting into position. And I think, yeah, discovering the, the you and what makes you unique helps you to develop your jiu-jitsu and make your jiu-jitsu unique because at the end of the day, if you're still doing the same jiu-jitsu that everyone else is doing at a high level, good luck. You really need to be doing special things and doing things in ways that people aren't doing. Otherwise, you're going to get the same results as everyone else has got. Yeah, I, I was just sitting nodding the whole way through that because I, I tried to be like my friend who's – half my size yeah. you know he's 20 he's 23 he does lapel guards and he's agile and he spins he does all this kind of stuff whereas i was a big boy like i was a fat git and i found that pressure passing when i discovered it uh, i think it was actually one of your videos i was like oh my god this is a this suits me down to t <laughs> and then i go inside outside control and because of the way i was passing and really pushing down people really driving through and all that they would leave an arm out. And then I found, oh, it's perfect for a key walk or it's a Kimura. And then I was, you know, submitting purple belts and I was going, what's going on here? This is not right. And I'd also ask, did you give me that? You know, because I, I wouldn't believe I could do that. But I, I see what you mean about the, it's your own individual journey, you know. And do you think that's where blue belts or people who maybe a couple of tabs on the white belt are going wrong? They're trying to be like their favorite black belt guy rather than developing themselves and finding out what makes them the best version of themselves? That's a, that's a fantastic, you know, question. Um, uh, I think emulation is important. You know, I, I think modeling as I, I prefer to use the nomenclature modeling, but I think modeling is very important. I think humans, I mean, that's how we learn most of what we do. Like let's just take out you know, the, the last, you know, 30 years of our lives. Let's look at when we were children. We learned most of our verbal and nonverbal communication, how to walk and everything else like that via modeling. You know, we didn't have to learn our language. We, we just modeled. We just listened and observed. And so I think there's a massive place for doing that, Ian. There's a massive place for going... I'm a lanky guy. Uh, who's a lanky guy like me that's doing really well? Oh, uh, Keenan Cornelius. Okay, let, let me try what he does. Let me watch him. And so I am a big believer in getting people to watch high-level people because I believe they learn a lot. 
by watching. I mean, we learn how to walk and stuff like that. So what makes you think we can't learn how to choke someone like that too? We just tend to turn that off as adults. But I think uh, in terms of white belts, yeah, like hitting barambolos and stuff like that, it's cool, but is it really developing you as an athlete? Um, and I think that's the biggest thing. Like I said, as a white belt, I'm not trying to make you into a jiu-jitsu outstanding grappler just yet. I'm trying to develop you so I can do that. Now, don't get me wrong. My white belts do fantastic in competition as do the other belts, but at the end of the day, I prefer to stick them, them to stick to a syllabus uh, when they're white belts. Now, if they really like, like – I've got one of my white belts. Like he loves the meows and stuff. Uh, and so, you know, he loves doing Baron Bolos and, uh, you know, playing inverted reverse De La Hiva and stuff, which is awesome. Like, I like those moves too, but it's just a part of the game. And uh, he, he probably damaged himself a little bit early doing that, you know, not having enough pressure, not having enough, uh, you know, hip movement. Because he was too busy turning upside down all the time, he never sort of just hip escaped and, you know, like he never sort of played close guard. He never developed attacks because he was too busy barren bowling. So it sort of harmed him in a way. But if that's what he finds fun, I mean, who am I to judge uh, what should or shouldn't be done on a mat? I mean, ultimately, jiu-jitsu is an unnecessary task for most of us. It's a luxury. So who am I to say, you know, what kind of Ferrari you should buy? And that's what jiu-jitsu is at the end of the day. But in terms of uh, as a white belt, I think by just doing the basic stuff and learning it the old-fashioned way, I think that gives you the biggest personal growth. I think if you're a lanky guy and you run down the triangle path too quick or something like that, you, you, you lose the discipline, you know, you lose the hip movement. And uh, then when you're against better guys, it just won't work. So I try to encourage all my white belts to just be good all-rounders. And then uh, once they're blue belts, start to specialize. But, you know, even if they're – I've got big guys. I'll let them spend their first three months starting on top. But then before they're blue belts, I'll tell them, like, you're spending the next six months on your back because that's your weakness. <laughs> you know, you're a big guy. You suck on your back. <laughs> you're great on top. So I think it's just all part of that process. And that's why the white to blue belt is so special for me. I think it's the most special belt ranking there is. Because I'm going through that just now where my coach is saying to me, like I do a, quite a few PA, personal training sessions with him, and he's saying, you know, right from now on I want you to start every row on your back. Instead of being the guy that takes him down and drives forward and does all this kind of stuff, pull him into guard and then work off your back. You know, just get used to it because you know, once you understand how to – defend the, the attacks and you know guard passing you'll then become a better guard passer because you'll understand it from both points of view because i was in danger of yeah. being too good a guard passer and not understanding how to defend it as such um mm -hmm. i mean i know we're coming up to our time but just now and I, well, I haven't even started my questions on skill development and business and stuff like that but i know that you're a father you know you've got um, other commitments you're running the business for those guys that are listening who you know are maybe struggling just now, they've got kids, they've got other commitments that are maybe taking over and they're not enjoying jiu-jitsu as much, how can they stay in the fight? You know, how can they just keep going? What advice would you give to somebody who's maybe you know, thinking, I don't know if I can keep doing this? You know, it, why, why do you think people fall out of love with it? Because it, it's changed my life. I can't understand it. But if you've been doing it for year in, year out, kids, other commitments, is it a way to keep the enjoyment there no matter what stage you're at? I mean, I think so. I mean, everybody's different, but, you know, like you just described like a million people in jiu-jitsu right now. You know? <laughs> like it's a pretty big uh, sector of people like that. And, and I think like, so I know I can just speak from my students' perspective. So all right, like, I'll just pull out like a purple belt or a blue belt of mine or something. And here's a guy, he's got a few kids. He works a hard physical job. He's had niggling injuries since he was 15 years old from his days playing soccer or something like that. And now, you know, like he's, he's pressed for time. He's pressed for time. He, he's not sure it can go on, blah, blah, blah. That is the guy that needs jujitsu. The guy that has all those other commitments that's having his time taken, who's always flat chat with his other responsibilities, that is the man that needs jujitsu. Not the person who's retired, who does nothing all day. Like, 
that life can be good anyway. You know, people that don't have their own time, that are so busy working or looking after family, friends, whatever, um, they're the people that need jujitsu. And sometimes I, uh, you know, I'll have a candid conversation with a student um, and like something I'll do with my students, for instance, if a student of mine is like on a membership, like I don't do any lock-in membership stuff. I, I, I do no, no, like, uh, no lock-in contracts with my membership. If they express that they want to leave, I'll like cancel their payment and I'll say, all right, I've stopped your membership. You can train for the next month for free because I want you to stay in. And I try to communicate to them to the fact that if they're contemplating quitting, then probably quitting is the worst thing that you could do right now because you've basically told life, told me, told yourself that, you know, you're lacking that discipline to, to last something out and that you achieve the black belt, whatever they want. Um, so definitely don't quit now. You need practice sticking at hard things. You need practice. You need your time. So on, ironically, I, I find that some of the people that leave jiu-jitsu were the ones that needed jiu-jitsu the most. And we've all heard that saying, jiu-jitsu is for everyone. And I agree, but I also would second that with a second sentence saying, but not everyone is for jujitsu. I mean, at the end of the day, the, everyone in this whole world basically knows how to have more money than they need to have and more health and fitness than they need to have. Just to pick two things that people want, but they seem to struggle with. They are very easy things to do. You could say money is simply obviously income minus expenses. So you try to live below your means and then increase your means and just save 5%, 10%. And by the time you're, you know, in your 30s or 40s, you're going to be like nearly retiring. And uh, so that's easy per se. Now, that's easy in theory, not in practice. Otherwise, the world wouldn't be in such big debt. But same thing with obesity and overweight, you know, like, hey, don't get me wrong, even I've been overweight in times in my life, you know, before doing this full time. And, uh, it, but it's a simple strategy. We know that it's calories and exercise, you know, like we, we know it's very simple. Um, and I think jujitsu is like that, you know, when people struggle, the answers are really simple. Oh, I'm struggling. I, I'm too busy, whatever. You need to get better at making time. You know, so don't throw it on jujitsu and blame jujitsu because let's face it, their life's not going to get better. You take some guy and he's working a full time job, he's got two kids, whatever. His life's not going to get better when he leaves jujitsu. The only hope is that he actually makes the decisions and improves his life and carves out time for himself and balances his responsibilities. That'll make his life better. Leaving jujitsu, I don't think I've ever heard of anyone that said that was the thing that made their life better. But I could obviously, probably like yourself, I could list hundreds and hundreds and hundreds that have credited jiu-jitsu with making their life better. So I think when people quit jiu-jitsu, I mean, sometimes it's necessary, I guess, for some small people that might have to move to an area without any jiu-jitsu academies. But I think quitting something that's hard, that's making you a better person and making you happy and things like that, like that's not a step towards success. That's a step towards just succumbing to inertia and your old bad habits of quitting and, and giving up on things. Yeah, I mean, when I started, I went down this road of self-sabotage and everything. I gave up the gym. I gave up, like, trying to learn a foreign language and stuff. I would always just get – when it got hard, I would just give up. And that's when I knew I really loved jiu-jitsu was – when I just kept pushing and pushing when stuff was hard and I thought, no, I'm not giving up on myself and it's opened up another level in my personality. It's shown me what I'm truly capable of by getting to the blue belt and now there's a whole new level of techniques and challenges that jiu-jitsu opens up. So I think you're right, people do need it and to go away from it is actually giving up on themselves more than giving up on jiu-jitsu because it's not going to make their their life better. And I think that's maybe a message that we need to get out there more. It's like jiu-jitsu is <laughs> life-changing, but it can be easy to think that's the problem. You know, like your, your injuries, you're struggling, you're rolling, the black eyes sometimes, the bruises – that's the bit that makes the that's the the fun bit of it. You know, I've got guys who come to the gym, and they live yeah. for it. You know, it you can see it in their eyes; they're so excited. I mean, I'm going through the the blue belt blues at the moment. You know, I, I was struggling for a few days there to kind of 
get back into it. And it just switches back on and it's completely made me, you know, I think about it the whole time. I'm thinking about like sh- how to shrimp better. I'm looking at techniques. Um, you know, I've, I've lost so much weight. My parents have said like what a difference is in my, just the way I look at life and how I'm going to do different things. It's it's something that I think you all have, we all have to sort of compete against ourselves. You know the grey matter between our ears. Well, I know we're coming up to our time limit. I've I'm so I'm delighted to have you on. There's so many things I really want to have you on again, and we can go into deeper stuff. But I love that. You know, I've had a great time this morning, and uh, well, I know it's evening for you over there in London, but I've had a great time, uh, and uh, I, I'd love to, I'd love to chat with you again. I know it feels like it's been nearly an hour, and we've just sort of started chatting. It just feels like hey, if, uh, this is why I know when I have great interviews like this, it's it feels like I've literally just started, and I'm like, what do you mean, forty five minutes? What do you mean an hour? You know, it comes an hour, and that you're the type of guy that I know that if we sat down and had a pint we would be sitting chatting about kids and outlook and all you know you you've just got that personality that people can't help not listen to and you know ask you and just absorb what you're saying and you can feel the passion in everything you do so what do you want people listening to take from this you know what would you like your their take home message from this to be uh i mean I think the biggest decision you can make, uh, I can only really speak of this from a masculine's perspective, I I suppose, but men and women, you know, if you're listening to this, just no bullshit excuses. Be, if you want to, you want to, if you've got an idea of who you want to be, the guy or girl you want to be, uh, go out and do it, do the things you need to do, be the person you need to be, take the risks you need to take, accept the losses, accept anything along the way. And just don't let anything stand in your way of being the person you want to be, you know, like uh, just do it. If it takes you that long, it takes you that long. If you're some bullied kid and you want to be some badass mother flipping black belt prime MMA fighter, just go do it. Just go do it. Don't fake it. Just do the work. Work out what you need to do to be the man or woman you want to be and just go do it because your life's ticking by. You're dying every second. So if you're you're not achieving that goal you like, you know, you're dying every second. If you're moving towards that goal you want and you're living the life that you're proud of, like you're being the hero, you know, that you're proud of, like you're being the character that you actually want to be, uh, that's living. So I would just leave that. You know, I wish someone told me that when I was five. I had great mentors in my uh, high school years and I was very lucky to, to have some mentors, but uh, they taught me a lot of things, but I, I wish someone said that to me. I wish someone just sat me down and said, who do you want to fucking be? Who do you want to fucking be? Like, who do you want? What do you want to do? Like, not about what you want or anything else. Like, who do you want to be? What kind of man do you want to be? What do you want your children to remember you for? Go and be that person now. And I think uh, that's something that I've always done in my life. And I hope other guys and girls can do that too. Uh, I obviously love that. I, I, I couldn't say anything better. You know, you, I think you've hit the nail on the head there. It's we forget that life is finite. You know, it's ticking away every second. And who do we want to be? Rather than being just like a twat, like the King Kardashians, you know, who do we actually want to be in life? And I think that's the thing with jiu-jitsu is really helping me discover who I can truly be in life. And and that's why I'm so grateful for finding it. And for like yourself, your, you know, Chewy, I'm getting to interview guys like you who are opening up all these avenues in life. And that's the biggest compliment I can give to you guys is you are helping so many people get better and become better men from it and you know you should be really proud of what you're doing i would love to go again talk about like how to become a better fighter etc but i know you've got a shoot off just now so can you just give a quick update on how people can keep in touch your projects you know how can we find out the channel train with you that sort of thing no worries that's easy. Look, I can't wait to speak to you again, Ian. I, I thank you for your time. I had a lot of fun this morning. Um, I would say, uh, I mean, the Grappling Academy, just youtube.com forward slash the Grappling Academy. I don't know. That's probably not the actual <laughs> URL, but uh, the Grappling Academy channel, the grapplingacademy.com is my website. Um, obviously, I'm on Facebook, Instagram. My handle thing is Smiley Tombo. Facebook is just Tom Davey. 
uh, yeah, like I love meeting new people and I hope we do get to share a pint in London or something sometime. Uh, for those in the US, I've got a few seminars, uh, Florida, Louisiana, Dallas. I think they're the only states I'm doing uh, for my February, March trips. I've got uh, some competing coming up, Jiu-Jitsu World League on uh, in Dallas in February and then the Houston International Open in March. I'll be back for Worlds. So, yeah, feel free, guys. Reach out, and I look forward to meeting some of you guys, and I look forward to chatting with you, Ian, uh, soon. You're doing an awesome thing for the community, and I really appreciate the time. Thank you, Raj. Well, well, we'll get something going, and we'll go into the, the stuff a bit deeper, and we'll, uh, you know, we'll make some awesome students from it. So I can't thank you enough for your time today, um, and we'll, we'll talk soon in the future. Hey, sounds awesome, Ian. Thank you so much for your time. Have a great day. That's it for another week. Thanks for listening. Absorb it. Practice it. Use it. Until next time, keep trying to hit that next level in your life.